And the second video I'd like to introduce you all to is done by the wonderful Jason L. Cook. We've been incredibly lucky to be able to secure Jason as an instructor every year. He's flown across from the States to support our event and various other events in the UK. He's exceptionally skilled at classical pugilism, uh, amongst other things. I know many of you train Fiore with him. He always runs our pugilism tournament for us every year and we always have an absolutely wonderful time. Fortunately, he has been kind enough to put together a short course on Jack Dempsey for us. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. The whole video should run for about half an hour, so grab a cup of tea, sit down, enjoy, or grab a punching bag and fight along with him. Hi there, it's uh, Jason Cook. So I am putting together a small little set of videos, a uh, bit of a mini course walking through uh, some aspects of Jack Dempsey's championship fighting. Uh, this is a little context of, uh, in the context of pugilistic striking, I think it's one of the most accessible books out there on how to, how to punch barehanded and protect your hands. Um, this has really sort of been inspired by the fact that I didn't get to go to York this Easter for the art that adorns you, sponsored by York School of Defense. Uh, that would be my fourth year, I think, in a row of teaching pugilism there. So this is really for those guys and anybody who else wants to look at it. So. Championship fighting, Jack Dempsey. Oh, that's backwards, that doesn't work. Anyway, uh, Dempsey is an interesting character. He fought, uh, you know, early in the 20th century. You might say it's a little late for bare knuckle, but he learned from some of the last of the bare knuckle fighters. He describes technique, the uh, punching technique that's clearly the right mechanics for, for bare knuckle fighting. Um, and what's particularly interesting about him is a lot of his career, he fought, uh, he fought in the heavyweight division. Uh, he weighed like 180 pounds. Um, when he won the title from Jess Willard, Willard weighed in at 240, 250. He was often um, uh, out, outsized in his fights. Um, and uh, that calls to mind Mendoza, Daniel Mendoza as well, um, who held the British heavyweight title in the you know, late 1700s at a stripping weight of 160 pounds, winning that against any number of uh, larger fighters. So I, I think there's some things there, that, that there's some parallels there that I find intriguing. Uh, one of the things that I find intriguing is the style of fighting that uh, Dempsey describes is somewhat different than how he, he himself fought. And I think some of that has to reflect on the fact that he fought guys who were much bigger than him, which caused him to, to, to use lower crouching stances, throw a lot of hooks, um, as opposed to the straight punching techniques he describes in his book. Um, I do think that that's a reflection of his opponents and necessity rather than some sort of like, you know, him creating something that wasn't true. Right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is his idea of the power line, something that shows up in other martial arts. And the idea here is there's a line that runs um, from your shoulder, down through your fist, out here, that allows you um, to put your full body weight behind your fist in a way that also is safe so that your hand is protected on impact, right? He talks about that being running from back here in the shoulder all the way down and really through the pinky finger uh, knuckle. Now, he also then says, that's a really fragile knuckle. You don't want to be targeting and hitting with that. So what you want to do is you want to hit with the bottom three knuckles because they form a nice little line. You disperse, disperse um, force that way and aim with your ring finger, right? So one way to find this, and we're going to take this, and for anybody who gets vertigo, I apologize. We're going to look at this pole here. And what he has you do is he wants you to walk up to something like a wall, get a nice lean. So I'm back here. You can just imagine it, please. Put your fist up about chin level and lean in. And lean, put your fist there and you can feel the power line, right? If you rotate this up, so you're on those top two knuckles, as many people in modern times are top of punch with, you can feel the tension that's creating your shoulder and it's just nowhere near as stable a feeling. Uh, I don't want to punch with that here, okay? Um, one other thing about this punching technique is when you use the power line, when you use kind of his, his approach to punching, you do end up rotating your shoulder up and over if you have your chin tucked, it's nice and protected. So I think that's part of his thinking, right? So, power line. Go find a wall, lean against it, find it. These knuckles, right? One other quick note on the power line. He, when you're punching to someone's face, he wants, you throwing, he wants you throwing, particularly with what he calls a lead jolt, our next topic, he wants you throwing a vertical fist. If you throw to the body, rotate it palm down. It makes the power line work and gets, gets the uh, shoulder up covering the chin. Have fun, go play with that. All 
Hi, this is the second of our little videos, uh, kind of walking through a little mini course in Jack Dempsey's uh, championship fighting, looking at how he describes punching mechanics, and we're gonna touch on range management, and that's pretty much we're gonna wrap up this. So the idea here is, um, we talked about the power line in the last section, which was the idea of throwing a punch so that it lines up nicely, you hit the bottom three knuckles, it lines up with your shoulder, and that protects the hand uh, and impact by, by backing it up, up with all the nice meat up in here, right? Okay, great. So what he, the first punch he likes to talk about is um, what he calls the lead jolt, right? And what this is not, this is not the modern jab, okay? The jab thrown with the arm, okay? This is a power punch draw, uh, thrown with a drop step, you're throwing your whole body weight behind it. And the trick there though, he talks about different phases of it. He talks about the drop step, so it's a weight transfer, right? Part of that is, it's a little hard to see. Let's take it back here far enough, yeah. So from here, I'm gonna throw it just into air here. When I throw this punch, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna be nice and loose. This is not a great form, this is just kind of just demonstrative. I want you to be loose just to work on play with this. Pick up that leg, and as you, you know, I'm gonna exaggerate the motion here. I'm going to pick this foot up and just make a nice long step forward, okay? And I'm going to exaggerate. Watch my rear foot, okay? The idea here is, as you're making that step, as you're making that drop step, you're instantly, you're going to, instinctively, uh, your rear foot should be providing a bit of lift, a bit of a, a spring off that rear foot. He calls it a trigger step, uh, not just a drop step. And the reason is that you're triggering that, that reaction off that rear foot. Okay, so if you have a heavy bag, line up on it, get about three feet from it. Um, and what I want you to do first is you're going to take it, you're going to get here, I want you to narrow your stance a little bit, not your normal fighting stance, be a little narrow, get up on the balls of your feet, he talks about teetering, okay, kind of a movement like this, right? And what you're going to do, I'm going to rotate this around just a little bit. So here, right, teetering, be nice and loose. Make that nice drop step, okay? Make that nice drop step, great, okay? Just hold your fist out like a battery ram, okay? That's just me dropping my foot. Here, you know, I'm just here. Right. And then that becomes, when you start practicing it, you get into a better stance, you're here, you're kind of your basic fighting stance. We'll talk more about that later. You're gonna be here, you're gonna wanna wait for it, you're gonna go find a spot, you're gonna go, okay? And you wanna punch through the bag, I got a little off center. Okay. Make a nice big pop, hit the bag hard, okay? Uh, I'm not hitting all that hard, I don't have my gloves on. Uh, so, there's something to play with, that's the lead jolt. If you don't have the bag, get into your nice little narrow little stance, teeter, I love that word, and just practice that. Make sure you're getting that rear foot. Be nice and loose, let your, foot hand, let your hand be thrown forward. Don't pull yourself forward, let that hand be exploded forward. This is all about explosive action, okay? That's the lead jolt. So we've taken a quick look at, uh, this is our third video, our third installment. We've taken a quick look at the lead jolt, this idea of using a body weight transfer to hit a long wet range strike. So this is being taken from way out here, right? I'm like three feet away, okay? So here, I'm there, I wanna get my thing. Nice big drop. Yeah, I'm making a big stop. I want to do that, okay? That helps the train. Get there, you're here, you want to... That's that punch, right? Uh, if you're throwing it to the body, if throwing it up to the chin, you want that up first fist, you want it to the body, horizontal fist. Okay, that's the lead jolt. That takes place from farther out. Um, the next punch he talks about, he talks about punching from what he calls the shoulder whirl. W-H-I-R-L, weird word to say, whirl. Okay, and what he's talking about, this is a more, this will be a more familiar type of punch to us. You're still gonna end up with something that looks like a jab out of it, uh, but it's not gonna be this, like, soft jab. It's a power jab, you know, okay? The idea here is, what he has you do, what Dempsey has you do, is, to practice this, when we first learn it, stand here like this, hands here, and then you're gonna whirl one shoulder forward and one back. It looks kind of funny, I'll be honest with you, because you're gonna end up like something like this, right? And you're kind of whirling forward. I'm exaggerating so you can see it, okay? So the idea here is, this is gonna go forward, this is gonna go back, right? It's gonna go, I find this so weird to do on video. Um, it's gonna go here, 
right? I'm pulling my hand back. So it's going to go here, right? I want to really, I really want to do it where my hand actually flies back, okay? And you can do it from this side. Flies back, right? And that's a practice technique. Obviously, you wouldn't do that in a fight. So the idea here, again, is one hand forward, right? One hand back, right? And you're really trying to get this sort of one, this, this going one direction, this going the back direction to generate power, okay? And then what he wants you to do is he says the ideal striking position from this, unfortunately, is with your feet parallel, like here, nice and flat, okay? Not in fighter stance, here. And you can just, right? And it's just, work, right? And I get that a little sloppy, but the idea here is to sit here and go, right? Get backwards, here. One shoulder forward, one shoulder back. And as a more realistic thing, you're gonna stand here like this, and you're gonna, right? So you're whirling that shoulder. Now, what does happen is when you get into a real fighting stance, is you're gonna get less power out of that whirl, particularly for your front, because of the angle of distance, right? So you're here, right? right? So you're gonna have less power. And you tend to need, one thing he talks about is take a little step out, get that toe in a little bit. I don't know if you can see that, you probably can't. So instead of standing with your foot pointing straight forward, toe it in a little bit. Get a little outside of your opponent, turn that toe in a little bit. It allows you to get more whirl, get more power with that punch. Okay? So, that's the shoulder whirl. Um, not the easiest one to see. That's something you've got to play with and really get a feel for. But try this little thing of just doing this. Yeah, it looks funny. I admit it. But, you know. And then try the version where you go, you know. Yeah, I admit it. It's silly looking. It's not a fighting technique. It's a training technique. Give it a go. So, we've looked at what Dempsey calls a long-range sharpshooter punch, the lead jolt. By the way, there is a follow-up to that broccoli or right. We didn't really talk about that too much. But the idea is, once you've landed that lead jolt, your hips are open, snap that wrist down and punch in. Drive this hip directly into the ground. Okay. So that's a long-range punch. You come in, you hit it. Hopefully you knock the guy back, right? So let's assume that your opponent is about there, okay? This is where your shoulder whirl punches. You're now in range to start throwing those, right? And he talks about those being, um, I thought their work was terrible there. Um, he talks about those being when you're standing in close, throwing lightning exchanges, okay? That's when the shoulder whirl comes in. So the idea here is I'm out here, I'm throw away, I get the opening, I hit, stay there. You start throwing the shoulder whirl. You're using that power, okay? Uh, one other thing that he talks about with that is, as you're throwing that, what you'll tend to happen, happen is you're going to go from a standard fighting stance where your, your feet are, are spaced apart, you're going to start creeping in and you're going to end up in the ideal position for that punch. Okay? Now, I'm not throwing those in the very support. Okay? Wasn't pulling my guard up either. So, always do that. Um, this is a striking practice at the moment, not full sparring practice. Okay? So, out here, far away, there. Hit your nice long punch, your nice lead jolt. And that should set up the distance. If they back off a little bit, that starts setting you up for throwing these nice big whirls. Notice we throw the whirl, shoulder rotates up, protects the jaw. Okie doke. Have fun. Hi again, and welcome to our fifth installment of my little mini series on Jack Dempsey's punching mechanics as discussed in his book, Championship Fighting. Um, as a reminder, we're looking to tie these back to the era of bare knuckle fighting, particularly fighting under the London prize ring rules. Um, and I'll have more to say on that later. And uh, that's also tying in a little bit of uh, Dempsey's approach to range management, right? So here's what we've looked at. Quick recap, we look at his um, don't lead jolt, which happens from long distance as he puts it, okay? So you can take a full step, bam, right? You can punch with a step. The next comes what he calls medium range. We throw with the whirl, his, the, the shoulder whirl, where you have the room to throw straight punches, right? But you don't have room to step, okay? And then obviously we come to close range, right? 
And that's where you don't even have room to throw a straight punch. You're going to be throwing a punch with your arm bent. Um, and it's going to look something like this, or this, or a straight uppercut. Okay. So, for short range punching, uh, Dempsey talks about two types of punches and breaks one of those categories down into two. Uh, the first category is hooks. Hooks are thrown with the arm straight, uh, bent, and you are using both the, the whirling motion, throwing your weight behind it, uh, also in what he calls an upward surge, uh, or a, a, also a hip hunch. Um, a little bit weird. So, the third, the, the, the second category is the straight uppercut, right? The straight uppercut travels straight up, and you're there using the full body of your, full power is pretty much coming from what he calls the upward surge, this idea of pushing straight up from your legs, basically, legs and hips. Um, within the hook category, he breaks down into two types of hooks. He talks about the shovel hook, which is connected to the body here and comes up. You get a little shoulder whirl into it and you punch the hips up, okay? It is thrown at a 45 degree angle. Uh, I like to think of hitting my opponent in the floating ribs and driving towards the heart. Uh, and that's the punch we're going to focus on. The second type of hook that he talks about is the outside hook, and that's the one you're most familiar with. That's the punch that moves here or here, you know. Okay? Um, why we're not going to focus on that one is, 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 is there several reasons. The hook is not well attested, the outside hook in particular, is not well attested uh, in the pugilistic, classical pugilistic era, as I call it. Uh, I also think it is a harder punch for the novice to master safely. It, uh, the likelihood of you throwing it wrong and breaking your metacarpals is quite high, though I do think Dempsey provides good instruction on how to do that, how to throw that punch properly. We may come back and look at that later at another time. Um, so we're going to focus on, for our purposes, talking about these different, managing these different ranges, uh, and then from a pugilistic, classical pugilistic point of view, moving into the clinch and into the grapple working towards a throw, something Dempsey doesn't talk about, uh, I think the, the shovel hook will suffice for our purposes here, okay? One last thing, why is it called a shovel hook? If you've ever done shoveling, get a shovel and get one with that nice big crossbar handle that you, handle, you hold like this on the end. And get a big one, get a nice heavy one. Get a big load in there. Get thing down on that thing, shovel in, and you're gonna do this. You're gonna do this kind of motion. And that's what he's talking about. That's what powers the, uh, the shovel hook. So I'm gonna do this uh, uh, left southpaw so you can see better. So here's what he says, shuffle in. Get to back here, arm loose, hangs loose. You know, let's just start your arm hanging loose, which I think is a good thing. Connect your hands. I got short arms, I got Tyrannosaurus arms. Um, so he talks about connecting it to your hip. I'm gonna get it onto my ribs. Sorry, that's where we're going. So here, nice loose, loose fist up here, and then just whirl. You're gonna to wanna to whirl and punch, right? So you're going to be getting a, a hunch here, this, this, this movement here with your hips, while also whirling your shoulder forward. This one forward, this one backward. So you're here. And you're going to go, right? And it's that kind of a motion. That's your shoulder, that is your uh, shovel hook. You know, you can see where you want to go with the right here. And he talks about the short range being head to head. So literally, on the heavy bag, if you've got it, get in here, put your head here. And you can see you have a lot more explosiveness from the off hand, um, your rear hand. So that's the shovel hook, and that's how you throw it. Um, it's a wonderful punch. I think it is the king of inside fighting punches. And one can argue that. Uh, and I thought, but I do also think it's the one that's safest for uh, the novice to learn to throw without wearing gloves. Um, Fedora Milinko, who was uh, a dominant MMA fighter in the prize de uh, days of Pride, the Pride promotion, um, was famous for his shovel hooks. You can throw them high, right? Um, that's not the purpose we're using them for here. Um, so again, let's talk about this one last time. If you've seen the movie The Professional, Starring Jean Reno and a very young Natalie Portman, uh, Gary Oldman as well. Uh, he talks about the hitman, the cleaner, working from three ranges. The rifle range. Handgun. Not quite as clear here. Knife. Right? Those are the three ranges of the hitman. Those are the three ranges of Jack Dempsey. Thank you. Hi, welcome to part six of our look at uh, Jack Dempsey's championship fighting and in particular his striking mechanics, which I contend translate well to bare knuckle fighting. 
Uh, and then we're going to be looking at how to tie that back to the idea of the, the concepts applicable in classical pugilism, the term I used for fighting under the London prize ring rules, which allowed for standing grappling. So Dempsey is speaking to an audience that, that is looking to win fights with striking. Winning, winning a fight with straight up striking uh, is very, very difficult. Um, you can go watch, and I'm going to talk about MMA a lot. Because I think MMA with the four ounce gloves, the lighter gloves, is more applicable as, a, as, a, as, a, as an analogy than when you're using eight ounce, 10 ounce gloves uh, in, in professional boxing these days. But even so, two heavyweights in MMA often get in the ring, it doesn't end by knockout. Uh, may end by a technical knockout where somebody gets knocked down, gets, gets mounted, and there's a uh, ground and pound, and the referee stops it. But, a sure, but, a, but that classic one shot to the chin, someone's unconscious, doesn't happen that often. And these are guys who are weighing 240, 260 pounds, wearing tiny little four ounce gloves, uh, pounding on each other, trained professionals, and they're not knocking each other out. So if you think that you're going to win your fight by knocking somebody out, more power to you, wish you luck. I think you probably wanna have some other tools. So where we're gonna part company with Dempsey a little bit is in the idea of once you're in that short range, once you're using your shovel hooks, instead of looking to either to just do damage and get out, which is a very valid option. I mean, at any point in any range, the option to bail, the option to retreat under cover is a valid option that you should always consider. In fact, it should be your first consideration uh, in any sort of social aggression point um, uh, context. But when you can work into the gap grapple, when you're in the clinch, there's some things to think about where those short range punches put you in a position to soften up your opponent uh, and then seek to put their butts on the ground. So, to review, we're out here, we're at sniper range. We're up, I'm gonna do the southpaw, make you see a little better. We're up, we're there, we're gonna get our hands up, we do our falling step, there. They move back, we're in, we're throwing break punches. And slowly we creep in and then we're here, and I'm throwing here. All right, see what I'm doing with my right hand? Can you see that? This is called framing, all right? The idea of keeping a hand on your opponent to know where they are, right? Ideally, when you frame, you should be taking control or at least defending from one of their weapons. In this case, let's say this is a person standing here like this. I want this hand up over here, hopefully trying to give myself some cover from their left hand, right? So that's framing, and that's giving you some chance. And then if you want to get out, you can push off and you're back here. Okay, framing. Where framing can progress to is you start looking for the grapple, or in the language of classical pugilism, chancery. Uh, two easy ones to think about. Imagine this is a person. I know it's a little bit difficult, okay? And their head's up here, okay? I'm framing, I'm here, I'm here. Hand slips up, I'm behind their neck, right? You get this kind of collar tie on someone, you're behind their neck, you are uh, keeping control of the elbow like that. You have control, you can push and pull, right? And all the while, hitting here. And if you're in tight and tight, yeah, they can get your shoulders up. You may take some damage here, but you're gonna do more damage to them, okay? And then this can lead into other options of chancery. Difficult to show without a partner, but something where you get a snap down, bring their head down and put them in a front headlock come around into a side headlock, right? And then punch them in the face repeatedly. Uh, and other locks and throws. You know, if you have this and you're here and here, you can step through into your cross buttock throw or your thigh throw. Um, if you're there and you're able to get up and slip into here, you can get a nice neck throw. All those are valid techniques, okay? From that. The other place to look for it would be, I'm here, I'm punching, I'm punching. Imagine there's an arm, actually we'll do it from this side. Imagine there's an arm here, Shoot up underneath. I want to get underneath somebody's arm. That's called an underhook. Google it. And that gives you power. You can lift them on that side and start looking for throws and trips and sweeps. Okay? So those are all things to look at. So one more time, the idea here is, and why I like uh, classical pugilism, why I like Dempsey, is, and in particular Dempsey's approach to range management, is how do you punch into the clinch? How do you punch into the grapple? And he describes it very well, right? He talks about these three ranges. Sniper, right? And then you're here, you're standing. And then you're here, and you're fighting in really nice and close. Um, and then from here, and this is where we part company with him, you start looking for your wrestling techniques 
in order to get yourself in a position to dump them on the ground. Um, good places to watch this again. MMA is a good place to do it. Um, left way, look that up, L-E-T-H-W-E-I. Uh, it's the national sport of Minyamar, formerly called Burma. Uh, if you Google Burmese boxing, that's another place you'll find it. Uh, those guys have a lot of Muay Thai training, so you're gonna see a lot of Muay Thai dumps uh, as opposed to some of the throws I'm describing, but nevertheless, you will see that lead jolt thrown there a lot. Um, so that's really what we were looking to cover here uh, in this little mini course. Uh, things I'd like to talk to you about, though, uh, is, again, why, why I think um, Dempsey is a good place to mine for, for classical pugilism. Uh, Dempsey talks about the beginning of the uh, big glove era in the late 1890s. And I looked that up because it struck me as very interesting. Big gloves, in his definition, were five and a half ounce, okay? So if a modern MMA glove which looks like this is four ounces, okay? And if you look around this room a little bit, this is a kickboxing glove, so it's not technically a boxing glove, but this is a, I think this is an eight ounce glove. It might be 10, but you get the idea, right? So a lot closer to this than this. Your punching techniques um, will probably in that era be far more applicable to bare knuckle striking than today where people are used to having nice big pillows on their hands. Um, for those of you who are familiar with boxing history, you know that you know, you've heard the term the markets of Queensberry rules, which also shows up occasionally in movies. Um, and the markets of Queensberry's rules is most people think about, well, they really brought in gloves and that protect your hands and it was great. Um, well, what it really did was take grappling out of the equation. The glove size up until the big glove era, so from the late 1700s through the 1800s, was uh, two ounces, uh, and they basically like gardening gloves. So you're not gonna be punching, your punching technique is gonna look more like what it would be without a glove than if you're wearing a pillow. So again, that's why I think these tie back nicely. So this is gonna end our little mini course on Dempsey. Uh, I may do an addendum, uh, um, episode to talk about some nuances on the lead jolt that I missed. Um, and I might come back and talk about the, the outside hook a bit more. Um, I might also add in the, the back fist or the chopper, which is a test that uh, Daniel Mendoza was famous for, doesn't show up at Dempsey. And that might round out sort of a, a striking of, of for, for bare knuckle boxing, bare knuckle fighting um, series for you. The last thing I would talk about is we didn't cover defense. Uh, that was not the purpose of this, this, this little mini course. Uh, that's a whole other topic. I might address that in the future. Uh, I do highly recommend you go buy this book. Okay? There is a free PDF floating around on the internet, uh, but it's terrible to read. It's, the layout's horrible. This costs like seven bucks on Amazon. It's worth the money. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was useful. I hope you found something um, you can take and use in your own art. Um, I think that you could do a lot worse with looking at than, than, uh, than this approach to finding your delivery mechanism for getting in close and delivering whatever your fight ending technique it is, whether that's an eye gouge, uh, you know, an arm break or whatever else, but being able to strike safely into close, managing that distance, um, this is a good place to start. Obviously you need to address some of the defense stuff, which we didn't do, as I said, maybe next time. Thank you.